I um, wanted to thank, before we start, uh, India Foundation and in particular Ram Madhav, to whom I worked two, three years back to put together the PDP BJP government in JNK, which is referred to as the Jinnah Alliance. Um, the last, now day and a, almost a day, um, we've been listening to a variety of views, and somewhere the issue of ethnicity, identity, nationalism is cropping up. And uh, in fact, this is something that one has been working around in JNK and to formulate some form of an acceptable resolution of what's been an enduring problem. If there's one big issue which has faced the Indian leadership right from 1950, which has endured till today, it is the issue in, uh, in JNK. And as Prasanna yesterday said, while he was talking to the Chief Minister, that if there is one place where the leader, instinct of leadership can be displayed, uh, it is JNK. So I'd start with, uh, with that and then try and see if I can make some abstractions about the, the issue of leadership in 21st century. So broadly, I kind of, speak about the leadership in crisis, some thoughts on JNK. And I'll pick up from where uh, the Chief Minister of JNK, Mehbaba Mufti, left yesterday with saying that the idea of India is an incomplete without the idea of, uh, of Kashmir. Um, while that indeed is so, but if you were to look at the larger civil society of India, not just today, but from 47 onwards or 51 onwards, uh, Kashmir has and continues to be a dissenting idea in the larger consciousness of the civil society of India. Now you can take one track and say, well, what this fundamentally means is that the idea of India is incomplete without dissent, but that's not what I mean here. Um, the idea of having a state, a sovereign within a sovereign, is something that has got, evoked a lot of responses, some uh, derogatory, some disparaging, some dangerous. And as I said, it's a dissenting idea. Now, if you look at what it was when it started off in 1951, Briefly, very briefly, I'll give you a sense of it, because I think some bit of history has to inform our judgments and our effort to resolve these issues today. A separate constitution, a prime minister, this is 1951. A president, a national flag, residuary powers, separate state subjects, um, jurisdiction of, no jurisdiction of Supreme Court, all control over taxes. So within a sovereign, within a sovereign, and how we have reached today is vastly different from it. But it doesn't matter what I think of it or what the Chief Minister of JNK thinks about it in terms of the idea, but as long as the civil society of India thinks of it as a dissenting idea, we'll have problems in conceptualizing the whole thing. And it doesn't even matter what the monolithic Indian state thinks of it, as long as the civil society thinks differently. And one of the things that I notice in the last two, three years, uh, having been with, in politics only about two and a half, three years uh, in JNK, is that there's a fundamental belief, and it got somewhere concretized in the last day, day that I've been here, is that there's a general belief that there's a misalignment between what the civil society believes and what the state does in terms of policies, the Indian state as it were. And currently we are redefining this. The whole effort underway is to align the beliefs, the ideologies of the civil society and the policies of the state. And this is obviously happening through a democratic process of elections and empowerments and so on and so forth. And I'll come to our experiment, which will redefine this whole thing a little later. But before that, I'd like to go into uh, how leadership, 
crisis emerged in, in JNK and how it's been a failure of leadership. If you go back to uh, 1951, and uh, Nehru handled it with a lot of romance, a lot of emotion, uh, without taking on board either the state, and when I mean the state, I really here mean the government of India, and or the civil society. The result was that the 1951 accord, the very famous Delhi accord of 1951, collapsed within a year and a half, resulting in the arrest of the architect of that accord, which was Sheikh Abdullah. First effort, first policy, first leadership instinct displayed. For the next 25 years, there was no leadership displayed, nothing. There were no local leadership. It was all <clears throat> without reference to any leadership. Somewhere, some, uh, yesterday, I, just a diversion, somebody asked what would have happened if Sardar Patel uh, and not Nehru would have handled it. It would have been pretty much the same. One can cook up various scenarios. And uh, one of my favorite ones is what would have been the economic policy of India had Rajaji been uh, there and not Nehru. It would have been a vastly different thing. But those really are, uh, you know, kind of conjectures. And what Patel did, even as he was Home Minister, was to refuse to accept the Prime Ministership of JNK and the Ministry of Home Affairs that time, it was called Ministry of States, he used to send letters to JNK government as the Chief Minister of JNK, not Prime Minister of JNK. Be that as may, for 25 years next, it was without reference leadership resulting in a lot of discontent brewing up in the state of JNK from 53 to 75. And these were all what normally get known as puppet regimes, real elections. We had all kinds of people from JNK who became, who ran the state. And that process, a lot of integration happens. Then comes 75, and Mrs. Gandhi seeks to legitimize all of it through another accord, which is the Indra Abdullah Accord. It happens in 75. Again, same style, same leadership style, and the 75 accord ends the same way as the 53 accord ends. The assembly is dismissed and elections are called for. This is the 1975, only about for a year and a half it lasts. Um, we go down further and again 1983, another landmark in our history. Um, it again is treated in a certain personalized family manner and an alliance is drawn up between Farooq Abdullah and Rajiv Gandhi famously known as the Rajiv Farooq Accord of 1983. It also ends up in dismissal of Farooq Abdullah soon thereafter. And the only thing here is two things are very important. One, the accord happens and within a year, either the government is dismissed or the guy is sacked, whichever way. And in both, or in all three accords and all, neither the Civil Society of India is on board nor the Civil Society elsewhere or the government is on board. It's purely at, done at, at very personal levels. And it's here I want to now bring in the experiment that is underway, which is 2015. Um, Mufti Muhammad Sayyid comes in and an election is fought. By then, the BJP has an overwhelming mandate at the national level. And here is one person who was a committed nationalist all his life but was constantly trying to engage with himself, with his people, to see if this dissenting idea can somewhere be converted into a variation which is acceptable to the country. And after being for politics for 60 years, he sets up a thing to resolve, to make it acceptable, and for, for anybody in, in JNK, for political parties also, the resistance to the idea of Kashmir as it was in 51, the dissenting idea as I call it, was the BJP. So he takes on a very, what I think is an extremely bold decision. The PDP was known as a soft separatist party. Huge mandate in the valley. BJP got complete mandate in Jammu. There were multiple rationalities for doing this, but it, and the, I can share with you, all of us contested the elections 
on a anti-BJP plank and yet the moment Zalz came in, sat for perhaps a week, 10 days and decided that he would want to do an alliance with the BJP. And I happened to be working very closely with him at that point of time. And as Mehbaj used to said, all of us told him, suicidal, please don't do it. We can't step out of our houses. We'll get lynched. And he stuck to it and said, no. The people of India have voted, have expressed confidence, and we need to engage. I'm not engaging with a party. I'm engaging the people of India. And he brought back the whole concept of civil society into the decision and went ahead and formed a government with the BJP. It's now a three-year-old government. I remember we were told it won't last a week. And in fact, on day one, we had such massive issues that I thought that the government is going to fall that particular day because of a press conference which was blown out of proportion by some people. But Mufti Saab being the kind of a contrarian leader all his life, he had started off in the 60s. And that time, in the valley particularly, Congress was seen as, pardon the expression, the literal word used to be scum of the earth. Gandhi Nali Ke Kide. This is how Sheikh Abdullah used to define Congress or any party from, for that matter from the from, uh, rest of the country. And people's engagements were broken if somebody aligned with Congress. This was 60s I'm talking of. And he had ensured through consistent hard work that Congress became an acceptable part of our political landscape today. So people, when we were kind of uh, working towards forming an alliance with the BJP saying, why don't you do the easier option of Congress, simpler? We said, no, I will go only with BJP. Of course, small, small issues like, I want to have Jammu on board, I want to do this. But the larger point really to me, when one was having conversation with him, was to say that you must now engage with them, even if you get consumed, it doesn't matter. PDP is only a 16-year-old party. What happens if we get wiped out? Something else will come up. But let's try this engagement to engage with um, BJP, form a government, and somewhere, because this party was the one that probably had the harshest views on, uh, on the status of JNK, um, constitutionally or otherwise, and once we engage with them, once you know the realities of it, where we have come from, where we stand now, we'll pr probably find a solution. The alliance, as I said, three years, very durable as it looks. We've had absolutely no problems. In fact, I, I used to be economic advisor of the government of JNK when there was a PDP Congress government. I think it was far more acrimonious than this, uh, this particular alliance. It's a very fragile alliance. That's true. It's a very contentious alliance. As um, Mufti Saab used to say, it's, it's a North Pole, South Pole coming together. But, uh, but with some degree of maturity, uh, displayed by either side, I think it's really working towards a resolution not only at the political level but also in terms of the developmental goals of JNK. And, but those are not really the ones that bother most people. It is on the politics of it uh, that most attention is focused. So it's a huge experiment which actually displays a certain leadership quality of going against the grain and trying to set a long-term experiment, setting in motion a certain process that should see, if not a resolution, but the framework for resolution emerge in, uh, in the state. And that would have probably resolved one of the most contentious issues facing the Indian nation state. And when I look back at three years, <clears throat> uh, what worries me is not what is happening politically, or what's happening in terms of the economy. Uh, what really worries me is what is happening socially in, uh, in, in the valley. I think that's my tie-in into the thing that's being discussed and debated here. Rahul, I think, referred to the lynching of 
a policeman, a yu pandit. I'll tell you a story of what happened. And I'll tell you where the level limits of my tolerance reach. In the back of beyond of South Kashmir, which is, I come from South Kashmir, uh, which has a lot of militancy right now. So we managed to hold it. Uh, the question again is, Rahul asked, was about how long. In that, an experiment was tried. A young entrepreneur set up a wonderful orchard. And this one had been struggling with since 2008, trying to transform the rural landscape of Valley by getting high density orchards. In fact, I contested my election only on one kind of thing was that our yield today is 20,000 rupees per canal of land. I'll transform it to one lakh. And we now started this whole high density orchards where yield will increase five times and you would see prosperity and so on and so forth. A young boy would come back from US set up an orchard, and in three years' time, it was like a model orchard, beautiful and brilliant. I never went there. I was a part of the whole process, but I never went there. At some point, um, the chief minister went, Mufti Saab, and it got a bit of profile. Many months later, uh, I think Mufti Saab had passed away, a set of people go and pull down the orchard. Now, I find this acceptable. It's okay. Part of the conflict, fine. Then they come back after having pulled down the orchard. These people come back and burn the trees. Burn the pull down trees. They pulled out. This also I find acceptable. Part of the conflict. One has been desensitized, dehumanized, whatever. I've lived there. Then something more happens. They come back a third time to eat the apples of the pulled down burnt trees. That I can't accept now. A policeman is shot somewhere in Shopian, and so are two other militants, and their bodies are lying on the road, and a bunch of 10 year old kids come and start spelting on the bodies. That I can't accept. I think the real challenge of leadership in Kashmir and also in the rest of the country. Most of you must have seen a video of a man hacking a guy and then doing a piece to camera saying, I've killed him for whatever and I'll, this will happen to you. That's the core issue uh, that needs to be addressed. I think it's not about leadership in terms of political leadership or economic leadership. I think going forward, the real core issue that will have to be addressed by leadership at all levels would be the social leadership in the country. Because I think what has happened is, the, for whatever reasons, we can do an academic dialogue, debate on all this, Somewhere, the society has undergone a change, which I see very starkly in JNK, which I see very starkly in Kashmir, the young kids. Uh, and it's not about radicalization, polarization. It's very easy to give names to these things and say radicalized and polarized and no. I think the issue of social leadership, how do you address the deep social variations that are happening in us? Um, and it can't be one meta-narrative that will transform all this, it cannot be, because there's a social context to each of these issues, a very specific localized context. So you will have to see leadership address these in the context of its emerging. We can do a case study, I'm involved in Kashmir, so we're doing something there, but it will not be just one Kashmir, there are multiple things happening, not of the same intensity perhaps, that you would uh, see in, in, in Kashmir. Which takes me to the theme that's been recurring here, is that you can't then look at a national identity. It can't be an equation, a linear number, 
which one can plug with various variables and arrive at a national identity? No. I'd much rather see it, national identity, as a matrix of regional, sub-regional identities, which then together form the national identity. It cannot be one linear number that you will arrive at through some political belief or ideology, no. It has to be socially created from below, and that's where it becomes very, very relevant to understand what the leadership of 21st century should focus on, not the economy, not the political. It cannot be a one homogeneous narrative. It has to be a collection of diverse and in many cases conflicting narratives that are micro and relating to the social context that they emerge in. And in, in large measure, it is my belief that this will never happen through the Indian state. It cannot. It has to happen through the Indian civil society. A much larger role has to be played by the Indian civil society, no matter what issue there is. I can tell you reams on about how it is the civil society of India that is disengaged from the civil society of Kashmir. The rest of the country, society, so socially, and it's so pervasive in a non-political field like academics. I'm sure only a few of you probably know that JNK carried out the most radical land reforms in the world under a non-communist regime, non-compensatory. Not one academic from the country has written on it. We have written tomes on Kerala, tomes on West Bengal, which were much less radical than JNK. Why? Because of a complete disengagement of the academic from JNK. The best book on Kashmiri shawls written by a Swiss. The best book on carpets by an American. The best work on Kashmiri language written by Grayerson. I have, I have been very hard pressed to find the wonderful, and I have been a part of the academia, except D.D. Kosambi's one paper on feudalism. I find very little work done it. Even in panchayats, finest, an earlier system of panchayats done out of JNK doesn't even get recognized. In fact, yesterday I was talking to somebody that even the data is not acceptable now. So the disengagement is not at the level of the government. And this is true for other issues as well. So my real, the thing I want to kind of sum up with is that it's not about leadership in a political sense. One, the role really has to be redefined in terms of the civil society's role and the leadership within the civil society. Perhaps one point that Rajiv made in terms of the institutions. And these institutions can't be restricted to the space of government. These institutions have to be strengthened in the civil society. And that is what would transform this country. And that is what I think would be the only thing that leadership in 21st century needs to work out. Thank you very much.